Thousands of mysterious mounds like these dot the southeastern United States. For centuries, their ghostly presence mystified all who laid eyes on them. Who could have built them? Surely not the sorry savages that the historians of the 18th and 19th centuries assumed the native population to be. A lost race, perhaps, which had come and gone before the first white man set foot on the new world, consigned forever into the oblivion of prehistory. Over the past decade, archaeologists have traced the route of the conquistador Hernando de Soto, searching for clues as to how the Indians may have perished. This painting in the Capitol building shows that romantic visions of the conquistador continue to celebrate the explorer's arrival on the American continent. But research tells a darker story. Driven by the mysterious disappearance of the mound builders, archaeologists are retracing the footsteps of the great conquistador Hernando de Soto. At digs throughout the southeastern United States, they cast new light on De Soto's route, revealing a trail marred by signs of human carnage. By the time De Soto set foot in Florida, he was a wealthy, seasoned veteran of Spanish ventures in the New World. De Soto himself had come to the New World when he was about 14, uh, was a big success in the terms of the day as a conquistador. He uh, uh, participated in the pillaging uh, of uh, Native American societies in Central America. Uh, he was involved with the Pizarro brothers in the uh, sacking of the Inca Empire. Uh, he became quite wealthy. But wealth alone could not satisfy De Soto's burning ambition. To leave his mark on history, he would gamble his fortune on one more throw of the dice, his own expedition in search of El Dorado. When they came to the New World, none of the conquistadors came with the intention of staying. They wanted to come over here, they wanted to find El Dorado, they wanted to find the gold of uh, the, the Incas, and if they didn't find that, they would go back without any kind of entitlement, any kind of status. And so they knew that, again, their, their, their backs were against the wall to, to make a name for themselves in the New World. And people had done it before, and there was no reason to think that they couldn't do it, too. Having plundered the great wealth of the Inca Empire, the Spanish turned their eyes northward. From there came rumors of gold, silver, and gems beyond the imaginings even of the greatest Inca monarch. In fact, a few precious trinkets had been taken from the natives of the north. But in one of the great ironies of history, the conquistadors would never learn of the true source of that wealth, their own shipwrecked galleons. Late 1530s, uh, wealth was going back on Spanish fleets. Uh, many of those fleets set sail from the coast of Mexico, came around the Gulf, uh, went down the Gulf Coast of Florida and through the Strait of Florida and up. Uh, some of them wrecked, uh, summer storms, hurricanes, and the Florida native people salvaged uh, material off there, gold, silver, uh, and so and in Florida archaeological sites and native sites, we do find gold and silver that came right out of Central and South America. Spectacularly oblivious to history's strange twist of fate, De Soto's proud conquistadors arrived in the New World in the spring of 1539, probably at Tampa Bay, Almost 700 strong, they set off with haste in search of their fortunes. When they stopped to ask directions, as it were, they were in no mood to be trifled with. Every time De Soto came to a new place, he would interrogate his captives. And the two main questions were, is where is the greatest prince in the land? Where can I find the greatest, biggest, wealthiest society? And he also specifically asked Indians about precious substances such as gold and silver. Uh, the Spanish would show the Indians the jewelry on their fingers and on their bodies and would ask the Indians, where can I find this, where can I find that? The Indians may have been tempted to mislead him, and in some cases we know that they did. But for the most part, I suspect they told him what he wished to know because his means of extracting it were so great, and, and the possibility of torture was so uh, obviously uh, present. In keeping with this charter from the king, De Soto read a lengthy statement to each group of natives he encountered. They and all their lands now belong to the Spanish crown, he informed them. They were to pledge their allegiance to Spain and accept the Catholic faith. Should they refuse, 
It came with this warning. With the aid of God, we will enter your land against you with force and will make war in every place and by every means we can and are able. We will take you and your wives and children and make them slaves, and we will take your property and will do you all the harm and evil we can. His so-called legal grounds for waging war established, Hernando de Soto set about the business of destruction and enslavement with a clear conscience. Though they came to the New World ostensibly for gold, God and glory, the Spaniards also quite clearly came in search of slaves. They brought uh, leg irons and uh, collars and chains to, to enslave the Indians. Probably at, uh, during most of the expedition, they probably had as many Indian slaves as they had members of the expedition. So at, at times the expedition was probably, uh, they had as many people as 800, 900 people, including all the, uh, the Indian slaves that, that were accompanying them. One tactic used by De Soto was to capture the chiefs. The chiefs were not only economically and politically important, they were also the focus of their people's religious life. It was devastating to the local populations when the Spaniards captured the chiefs because it just paralyzed everyone. The population was brought to its knees almost immediately. And the reason for this is because the chiefs were the ideological centers of the universe. It was their cosmological point of contact with the other world. And why is this important? It's important because the chiefs, through their ideology, could communicate with the knowledge of the ancestors in the other world. Until recently, our most informative sources about De Soto's odyssey and the Indian cultures he encountered were the records and diaries kept by members of his force. Archaeologists decided to pick up the now cold trail of his expedition using these accounts. There are actually three first-hand accounts uh, written by participants in the DeSoto expedition. They give uh, almost a day-by-day -day itinerary. What we do then is to take those accounts and look at our maps and try and find those locales. Where is a big lake? Uh, where is a big village? And so on and so forth. And in this way, sort of like a detective works, uh, take a lot of little bits of information, uh, put them together, sort of see what the best fit is. And this is how we begin to reconstruct the route. Looking for evidence of the Spanish, archaeologists reasons, would be the best way to find the remains of lost Indian cultures. Within archaeological sites, we're going to see evidence at some of them uh, of the impact of the Spaniards on the native people. Uh, and in fact, at several sites along the right, we see very graphic, uh, horrendous evidence. Uh, Indian bones, uh, the remains of people that lived uh, in 1539 that have been cut with uh, Spanish weapons. One of the important contact sites in Florida is called Tatham Mound. Archaeologists found the remains of nearly 300 individuals, most of whom died at the same time. The cause of death was grimly clear. But included in this uh, group of people uh, were bones that clearly showed uh, sword cuts uh, through them. Uh, uh, one horrible one, the left shoulder of an individual cut all the way through, uh, probably just cut the whole right arm of, of a person off. Uh, some of the long bones, uh, when, when the Spanish fought, uh, it was typical for them to try and cut the tendons uh, and muscles in uh, legs so your opponent fell down and then go in and cut them in, in the wrist uh, so they drop their weapons and then go in and give them the... Uh, the, the coup de grace, uh, either on the head or whatever. Uh, clearly, people uh, were killed because of these uh, uh, little battles, little skirmishes uh, that occurred. The accounts also reveal that the Indians fought just as violently as the Spanish. The witnesses record horrifying scenes. The Indians ambushed their enemies so cautiously and skillfully that not a single Spaniard who strayed so much as a hundred yards from the camp escaped being hit by an arrow and beheaded at once. And in spite of great haste our men made to assist their companions at such times, they always found them decapitated. But the Spaniards had devastating weapons at their command. They had crossbows, they had arquebuses, they had cannon. Uh, I think good weapons, I think the best weapon, however, was the horse. And 
uh, repeatedly when the Spaniards were endangered, uh, mounted knights on those horses could simply rout uh, an Indian force. Uh, essentially, a knight on a horse was the Sherman tank of the day. Uh, he had his uh, um, sword, his armor, his attack dog, his uh, war horse, uh, pretty much impenetrable and uh, could attack Indians and simply with horses, you know, charge into them, uh, defeat them, kill them. The basic weapons of the Indians would have been war clubs and bows and arrows, and to some extent maybe spears, which I don't think was used very much. The weapons of the Spaniards, on the other hand, the, the combination of the men mounted on horses with lances and dogs was devastating. On horseback, the Spaniards literally let slip the dogs of war. Um, the Indians couldn't outrun the horses and they couldn't outrun the dogs. These dogs were war dogs. They were Irish wolfhounds, they were mastiffs, and they were, they were greyhounds, and they were trained to kill people. But you have to understand that DeSoto and his army were here to do a job. Uh, they were here to explore, conquer, and settle. Uh, and they would stop almost at nothing to do that. Uh, their lives were at times endangered, uh, so they did whatever they had to do. By our standards today, uh, their behavior was often extremely cruel. On October the 18th, 1540, it appeared the Indians had had enough. They planned an elaborate ambush to end the Spanish terror once and for all. At the village of Movila, Chief Tuscaloosa staged an elaborate surprise attack against De Soto and his army. The Spanish slaughtered the Indians where they stood. It was a bloodbath. The eyewitness accounts tell the tale. Women and even boys of four years of age fought with us. And Indian boys hanged themselves not to fall into our hands and others jumped into the fire of their own accord. The arrow shots were tremendous and sent with such a will and a force that the lance of one knight was pierced by an arrow. We killed 3,000 of the vagabonds without counting many others who were wounded and whom afterwards we found dead. After the battle, we rested there for a month and we burned over much of the country. Movila was a turning point, a death knell not only for the native people, but for De Soto's waning hopes of gold. After Movila, De Soto, as one of his chroniclers said, began to waste life. And I think that meant life, the life of his own army, and especially the life of the Indians. Um, and it was because he smelt failure. He smelt failure of his expedition, and he smelt ruin. He pushed his men very hard, um, and uh, most particularly the Indians. And this became even more extreme in 1542 in, in the last months of his life, uh, when he uh, must have known that everything was gone, everything was lost. And at this point, he began to attack the Indians with great savagery. Uh, he would uh, wage a kind of me lie action against a village in which he would order his men to kill everybody, kill everybody. And the purpose was to inflict terror on any Indians who happened to hear about this incident. Despite the advanced weaponry and savagery of the Spanish, the Indians might have prevailed had it not been for a more insidious adversary, disease. As the conquistadors marched west, they also spread deadly diseases. Epidemics that led to immense population declines spread throughout the 16th century southeastern United States. The question of uh, irrevocable population loss is most clearly seen, I think, in the lower Mississippi Valley, where I've done a lot of archaeological work. When De Soto comes through in 1540, there are approximately 80 villages, large villages, between like Memphis, Tennessee, and Baton Rouge, Louisiana. De Soto passes through, stays there four or five months, but then passes on through. And there is no further European contact until 1682, when La Salle, representing the French, 
are come down the Mississippi. He records only five villages. So the question is, what happened? What happened to the other 75? They disappeared, they died, and they likely died of disease. As the expedition moved forward, the people and the animals they took with them, the horses, dogs, and pigs, transmitted new diseases into the susceptible native populations, and they in turn transmitted them to others. the United States, take a major city and you reduce it by say 98 to 99 percent, you'd have an idea of how devastating it was these societies. When they emerge, that is when these societies, we see them through the eyes of the early English and French explorers, the whole fabric of society is completely different. These are very, very different people. Is it possible that warfare, even between the Native American tribes, could have caused this depopulation? Um, the question of warfare versus disease and depopulation is um, is an important one to look at. There's two, there's several lines of evidence that we use to say disease versus warfare. First of all, 16th century warfare is very primitive. And there may have been individual instances like um, Mabila, where population was wiped out. But everybody else is intact. Those are individual towns that were destroyed. Okay. With disease, however, because disease can spread between people, you would have greater destruction across a larger area of space. And wherever DeSoto spent large periods of time, people disappear. And there's no way that warfare, 16th century warfare, can do that. 20th century nuclear warheads can do that, not 16th century warfare. The depopulation of the local Indians in this area uh, was dramatic. And one reason that it happened on such a large scale was that when people in a town were sick, everyone was sick at the same time, apparently. And so even if a glass of water would save your life, there was no one to go out to the local lake or river, get you a glass of water so that you could survive. And so having everyone sick at the same time, there was no one there to go out and gather herbs, uh, people to go uh, hunting, bring back game. And the villages could have had minor illnesses and, and most people could have starved to death. Thirty years after the expedition, many of these native societies also changed. There were great social and cultural upheavals in the southeast. The Florida Indians, of course, unfortunately, simply died out. And by about 1730s and 40s, literally what had been several hundred thousand native peoples uh, was down to handfuls. Uh, and Creek. Indians uh, from Alabama and Georgia who had been raiding into Florida even in the late 1600s uh, began to move down in and establish settlements. About 1740 uh, they would continue to do so but those uh, Creeks who the Spaniards often called Cimarrones or runaways because they had left their native homes uh, later became the Seminoles or the Seminole of today and so indeed Florida was uh, repopulated at least in part by Native American Indians and the Seminole uh, their descendants, uh, of course, live here today. You not only have the collapse of the human population, which was certainly very important for the maintenance of the society, but you also have a tremendous loss of information. If you have 98% of your population dying, you may have a couple of percent of the population surviving, but what if all the medicine men die? What if all the shamans die? What if your people who hold the esoteric knowledge, which is important for communicating with the other world, what if all of these people die? then you have some real problems. You, you lose that continuity of uh, knowledge. Uh, what was here in the 17th century was very different from what was here in the 16th century. For some of the Indian peoples that DeSoto encountered, the Usita, the Makoso, uh, some of the others in Florida, our only mention of them and our only information comes from archaeology and from uh, what the DeSoto expedition tells us.
De Soto died penniless in 1542, presumably of fever, as his army camped on the banks of the Mississippi. For nearly a century after De Soto's death march, refugees crisscrossed their emptied homelands. New tribes and languages emerged. The collective past was lost. And by the time the English and the French colonists had laid eyes upon the mounds and asked, whose monuments were these? The descendants of the mound builders had forgotten. Only today, with the help of archaeology, are they reclaiming their lost past.
Mm-hmm.